spread. Range of targets, 1,500. Down by sight, Coxon. Tell us... This is a David and Goliath story. The small high-speed attack boats of the Royal Navy, armed with torpedoes that could sink the mighty battleships. They changed naval warfare forever. You know, Shakespeare talks about a band of brothers. Well, we were a band of brothers. There's no doubt about that whatsoever. But the story of the Royal Navy's motor torpedo boats and motor gunboats has never been told. They won more decorations than any of the other branches of Britain's forces, fired more torpedoes with more hits than the entire submarine service. They sank over 500 ships. They were known as the Spitfires of the Sea. And this is where it all began. This boat at the Imperial War Museum in Duxford is coastal motorboat number four, capable of over 40 knots, armed with a torpedo. It started back during World War I, when three enterprising young officers approached the traditional and highly conservative admiralty with a dangerously revolutionary idea. They wanted to fit a torpedo to a fast craft. And the Admiralty, in a blinding flash, flash of foresight, allowed them to do it. It led to this. The actions of this actual craft, captained by Lieutenant Augustus Agar, proved the destructive power of tiny craft armed with a torpedo. Agar took on and sank the Russian battleship Oleg in 1919. The torpedo had found the mark. A large, colourless smoke. Almost as high as the mast of the ship, shot up. There's no doubt about it. I hit the target. He was awarded the VC. Agar and his colleagues are seen as the fathers of the Royal Navy's coastal forces. But with the peace, the Admiralty reverted to its old ways. Tradition and a clean, shiny ship was all that mattered. Despite their proven destructive power, coastal forces were disbanded. They didn't have much consideration for the achievements of these small boats. Um, their, their focus was very much on bigger ships and guns. It was a huge mistake. Hitler was well aware of their value. During the interwar years, the e-boat was developed and finessed by Lursens of Bremen. It was to become an almost invincible foe. The German e-boats were built of steel, alloy and timber and were very sturdy sea boats. They were powered by three diesel uh, Daimler-Benz engines, very powerful, and they had a lot of ammunition and they were very fast. Fortunately for the Admiralty, a number of British entrepreneurs recognised their value and set about designing their own fast attack craft to sell to the Navy. Among them, Peter Duquesne of Vospers and Hubert Scott Payne, who owned Supermarine and the British Powerboat Company. But the Admiralty were deaf to their entreaties. Only belatedly on the eve of war did they realise their mistake and ordered their first attack craft from Hubert Scott Payne. But with his stern-firing torpedo system, Vospers spotted an opportunity Peter Duquesne grasped their shortcomings and produced these forward-firing torpedo attack craft. The Admiralty dumped Scott Payne and went for Vospers. Scott Payne went to America with his designs. The Americans loved them and they became the mighty successful PT boat. To deliver a blow with one of the most powerful craft this war has developed and exploited, the motor torpedo boat. The PT. Back in Britain, as war broke out, a major recruitment drive was on. Only the very best made it to coastal forces, but they were loathed by the Admiralty. 
Coastal forces were mavericks. I didn't like the barracks, it was too strict. Didn't wear uniforms and didn't follow naval regulations. And many recruits had never even been to sea before. And my first job was lookout on the bridge. And I was sat on the bridge with a pair of binoculars, you know, so young kid enjoying it all. And after a while, my skipper, Claude Holloway, he said, anything to report, Ellis? I said, no, sir. He said, what's that up ahead? Bloody Scotch mist, and it was the island. And I thought, well, why have I got to tell him? He knows where he's going. You see the island, why should I tell him? That was all funny, you know, it was all part of it. These men went to sea in the dead of night to fight the enemy in all weathers in a wooden, open boat crammed with 100% high-octane petrol effectively floating bombs. They fought their enemy just yards apart, at close quarters and in the pitch dark. The vast majority of actions by coastal forces were fought in the dark. The actions were so quick. I'm um, sorry, you got a speed of about 40 knots, which was it's quite a speed. And uh, no sooner you start, then it's, it's all over. They were young and they made great copy for a press hungry for good news. But their greatest foe, the e-boat, larger and faster, outpaced and outgunned them at every meeting. Oh, we were very envious. We reckon they were, you know, they were diesel engines, low-lying, excellent sea boats, well-armed, uh, much less vulnerable because of diesel instead of petrol. Yeah, we were, we were very jealous. Of <laughs> Until this man came along, Noel Macklin of Fairmar Marine. He designed and built the dog boats, the most successful attack boats of the war. They were mini battleships and were able to take on the e-boats on an equal footing. Coastal forces' actions are moments written in history. The raid on Saint-Nazaire was one of their greatest successes. It had the only dry dock capable of handling the giant German battleships. Bismarck, the Scharnhorst, and the Neisenau that roamed the Atlantic. Without it, they couldn't operate. Coastal forces led in the converted warship HMS Campbelltown, stuffed with explosives and under heavy fire, and rammed it into the dock gates. It was a triumph. And sadly, a lot of, well, a lot of Germans, but also quite a number of French, who were all sort of, you know, just gazing or looking at this thing uh, were injured, but uh, still, it did its stuff, it did, it did blow up, and uh, the dock was not used again. On MGB 314, able seaman William Savage was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross. The citation stated it was in recognition not only of his bravery under fire, but also for the valour of so many in coastal forces during the operation. Coastal forces also operated a secret flotilla out of Dartmouth, running agents to and from occupied France, again in the dead of night, rendezvousing with French resistance in remote bays on the treacherous Brittany coast. It was a feat of navigation and seamanship like no other. In home waters, they took on and defeated the e-boats that were terrorizing British coastal shipping. In the Mediterranean, they wreaked havoc with German supply lines as war raged from one end of the Mediterranean to the other. It beggars belief that at the end of the war, when a group of e-boats came to Felixstowe to surrender, this was the first time the Allies had ever seen one in broad daylight. Yeah, they were. Damn good boats. Coastal Force's greatest foe was finally defeated. But the report into the e-boats and their crews painted a grim picture. A few were arrogant and haughty, and all of them entered Felixstowe Dock laughing and joking. They appeared to have no conception of the havoc and destruction they had brought on the world, and showed neither shame nor remorse for the bestial behaviour which has made their nation the most despised in the world. This was the culmination. This was really the end of the war for coastal forces, seeing the enemy coming into an English harbour 
with a white flag flying and then the white ensign hoisted. That really marked the end of the war, I think, for coastal forces. This film is the briefest of glimpses into the untold story of coastal forces, of the often very young men who lived and died in the toughest of conditions. Their achievements are disproportionate to the size of their boats and weapons. The Coastal Forces Heritage Trust is dedicated to keeping their memory alive, but they do need your support. If you have at all been inspired by this film, please do get in touch. Even if you can't donate any money, please do just sign up. The Trust will send you a free newsletter every month.